Continuing along with the seven mysteries, we've made it to the mystery of Christ and the church. We've already done the mystery of godliness, showing you that Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. We've looked at the mystery of Christ in you, showing you that Jesus Christ comes to permanently live in every believer at the moment of salvation. And now we're on the mystery of Christ in the church. And it's really similar to the mystery of Christ in you. So we'll probably go over some of the same stuff that we did in the last one. But you see, all three of these are really important to you right now. A mystery of godliness. If Jesus Christ wasn't God, he wouldn't have resurrected. He wouldn't be living in you because he'd be dead. And you wouldn't be resurrecting in the future. The mystery of Christ in you is so important as well because that's your salvation. That's what proves your salvation. That's what keeps you saved. And then the mystery of Christ in the church you're going to see is so important also to prove that you can't lose your salvation. And you find this mystery in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 32. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So this is a great mystery concerning Christ and the church. While the mystery of Christ in you had to do with the fact that Christ indwells the believer, the mystery of Christ and the church has to do with you being in Christ so the other one had to do with Christ being in you. This one has to do with you being in Christ. And if you can get a hold of this mystery, then you realize you can't lose your salvation because you are in Christ. So the mystery of Christ and the church. The first thing I want to talk about is what is the church? Well, the first thing we want to look at what it is not. If you want to find out what something is, something you can do is Find out what it is not, and that sheds a whole light, a lot of light on what it is. So what it is not, it is not a building that you go to on Sunday. The church is not a building that you go to on Sunday. We call these church buildings, but Acts 748 shows you that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. So it's not a church building. The church is not a local group of believers getting together. That's a local church, which is good. Local churches are good, and that's in the Bible. Paul talks about believers gathering together and that being a church, but it's not the church. A good verse to go along with that is 1 Corinthians 1-2, which says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. That's a local church, the church of God which is at Corinth. But then look, look what he goes on to say in the same verse. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, look at this phrase, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now that is the church. He went from talking about the local church and to the church of God which is at Corinth to, do, to those that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the church. So there is a physical local church, and if you realize there is a local church, then you'll know you can't neglect gathering together. You know, you don't want to neglect gathering together with other believers at the local church. Even though the church is spiritual. You see, a lot of people, since the church is spiritual, they say they don't need to gather together with other believers. And they become like a lone wolf. So you want to know that there is a local church, but it's not the church. And you need to realize the church is not an organized denomination with a name and a history like the Baptist church or the Catholic church or the Methodist church. Now, if you've been listening to me very long, you know I go to a Baptist church. And most of the preachers I listen to are Baptist preachers. But being Baptist has nothing to do with being in the church. It's got nothing to do with your denomination. 
the Church of Christ claimed to be the church and not just a denomination. So uh, studying this mystery will also help you against the cults like the Church of Christ. They claim to be the church that the Bible speaks of. Uh, someone who doesn't belong to any local church could be a member of the church because it doesn't have, it's, it's not, the church is not the local church. The church is not an organized religion. The church is not a building. So what, the next thing is, what is the church then? The church is the body of Christ. In Colossians 1.18, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So the church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So the church is the Lord's body. The church is all born-again believers in Jesus Christ. And we make up the Lord's body. No matter where a person lives, goes to church, or how they're currently living, if they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to be their crucified, buried, and risen Savior, then they are in the church. They are part of the Lord's body. They are part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. He says, Now ye are the body of Christ. He's saying this to the Corinthians. And members in particular. The Corinthians, the most carnal church, had a lot of problems, especially in the first epistle. They had fornication going on. They were puffed up in their knowledge. They had some really whacked out crazy ideas. And he tells them, the most carnal church, the most carnal believers, that they are in the body of Christ and members in particular. And if you're saved, you've, there was a time when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, then you are the body of Christ and a member in particular. And back thinking about that verse I, sh I told you at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 1-2, he said, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, that's the local church. But then he says to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He said with all that in every place. That's the church. The church is everybody everywhere who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody everywhere who's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is part of the church. Even the dead in Christ, the ones that have, that, have, that have already died, but they believed on Jesus Christ, that is part of the church, the body of Christ. And so you got phrases like the church militant and the church triumphant. The church, if you're down here, we're fighting, we're contending for the faith. Us born-again believers, we're fighting, we're contending for the faith. That's the church militant. That describes the church, physical church you can see on this earth. But then you got the church triumphant. That's the church you can't see. That's the church, that's the part of us that's already saved. And we're just waiting on our body to be. If you realize that every believer is in the body, every believer, every person that's believed on Jesus Christ, put their trust in him to be their payment for sin. Everybody who's ever done that is in the body of Christ, the church. Then you'll never be confused by Catholics, by Church of Christ, or by Baptist brighters. You'll never be confused by them. L learning this mystery will keep you so doctrinally straight. You'll realize that every person who has believed on Jesus Christ, is your brother or sister in Christ, and you're going to live with them for all eternity, even the ones that you have disagreements with, they are still your brother, and they deserve to be treated like family, no matter if you disagree with them on stuff. Every part of the body is needed. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, For as the body is one, 
and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So your body has many parts, yet it is all the same body. You got hands, you got feet, you got legs, you got eyes. It's all the same body. Just like Jesus Christ's body is one body, but it's many members, all saved people. Yet it's one body. It's made up of all born-again believers, but it's one body. That's a mystery. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, this is a key verse right here. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. It's a spiritual baptism, no water. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That shows you it's spiritual. It's not physical in water. It's a spiritual baptism. See, the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. See, when you got saved, you died with Christ. God sees your flesh is dead. You died with Christ. You were, you're buried with Christ, and then you're risen. And spiritually speaking, you're already sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 and 15. For the body is not one member, but many. Your body is not just one member. It's got all kinds of members. It says, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? You can't say you're not important just because you're not the pastor or the song leader or the Sunday school teacher. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? You see, nobody can say you're not needed. Sometimes I feel like I'm a big waste of space. Pretty much everywhere I go, I feel, feel like a big waste of space, and I'm not needed. I feel like I'd be better off just to stay away, stay at home, get away from people. But we're all important. We all have something that needs to be done. And when you start thinking like that, you go back to the Bible. God explains here we're all needed. In 1 Corinthians twelve eighteen it says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. He's given you the ability to do what pleases him. You're pleasing to God. And he wants you to do what he's given you the ability to do, and it helps the whole body. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So no matter who you are, God says you are needed, and just as important as the next guy. And this is referring to all, referring to all born again believers in the church. How much, how much more when you're out in the world? You think there are certain big shot people out there who are more worthy to walk this world than you? And I start feeling that way at times, many times. But you're a king. He's made us kings and priests. You're a king. You're a king's kid. God has more use for you as a born again believer than he does with these big shot people, these lost people out there who you think are so important. They aren't even a part of God's program if they're lost. You know, they, they're walking on red carpets. They got billions of dollars and mansions. And to this world, you get the world's goggles on and you see just some great celebrity. But they're dead in trespasses and sins. In the sight of God, they're a worm. They've got the wrath of God all over them. God sees you. When, he look, when God looks at you, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. He, you're, you're way above them in that sense. But just in that sense. You're not better than them. But in the sense when it comes to salvation, you're a king, you're a king's kid, and they're headed for hell. So stop feeling like these people are so much better than you that you're just a waste of space, that you 
aren't needed. You're needed. You're needed when it comes to other Christians in the body. There's nobody in the body that's better than you. You know what? You, you couldn't decide which one you'd, you'd rather have, the, the ears or the eyes. You know, you want both. You need both. 1 Corinthians 12, 22. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Even the parts of your body that you don't even know about. Like there's parts of you in your body that you don't even know is there that you didn't even know that you needed. You know, I got my gallbladder took out. I really don't know what all that's for, but I probably need it for something. I got it took out when I was young, very young. I got my tonsils took out when I was very young. I mean, I've not missed them, but maybe my life would have been better off with them. I mean, they were in there for a reason. You know, all these members of our body, they're important even if you don't even know what their, what their purpose is. Uh, I've, only, I've always only had one kidney. I, got my, I had one kidney that was not ever developed, and I had to get it taken out. So I wonder what my body would have been like with both kidneys. How would I feel right now if I had both working? You see, everything you need at all. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 23, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon the, these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. You see, the guy who may not dress good, the believer who may not dress good, might not s smell good, might not have as big of a presence as somebody else, he's just as important, and if he yields himself to God, he will help the body just as much as the next guy. Maybe in the background doing stuff you don't even realize. It says, For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, no division or separation, but that the members should have the same care one for another, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. You see, just like your your physical body, if my hands are full, I'll pick something up with my feet. While I'm at work, if my hands are full of the ice cream I'm catching to put on a pallet, I'll use my head to push the other ice cream out of the way. You see, you, you want all your body. You use it all. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You are the body. You're part of the body. You're a member. You ever wanted to join something, be a member of something that was great and be a part of that? Some team, some club, some group of people. You wanted to join it and be a part of it so you, you could feel better about yourself. Well, you, if you're saved... You are a member of the greatest thing in the universe. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. You are a part of the greatest thing in the universe. So that's what the church is. Now, how do you get in the church? We've already talked about this a little bit, but I really want to nail it down. How do you get in the church? To get in the church, you simply believe on Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You're a sinner. You've sinned against God. You know the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood. He was buried. He was resurrected. He paid the payment for your sin while he was on the cross. And all you had to do to be saved is come to him as the guilty sinner you are and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 22 through 26. It says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Everybody sinned, so everybody needs a Savior. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So you get Jesus Christ through faith. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. 
shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. You see, the law can't save you. It's, a, it's by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You get part. You get a part of the body by faith in Christ Jesus. You become a part of God's family by faith in Christ Jesus. And he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's how you get in. When you're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, which you didn't even know happened at salvation, it was an invisible spiritual thing that took place. You didn't even know it happened. It happened the moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get in the body. Now, the Baptist brider will try to make you think that you're not in the bride unless you've had an approved water baptism in one of their Baptist churches. But this baptism here in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 isn't even water baptism. It's a spirit baptism where the Holy Spirit places you in the body of Christ. The church of Christ takes it a step further. They want you to think it's water baptism. And they want you to think that you're not even saved unless you've been baptized in water by a Church of Christ elder, let alone a part of the church. But it is the Holy Spirit that baptized you into the body, not a man in a, in a baptismal pool. When the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body, that's what saved you and put you in the church, which is his body. And it was an invisible thing that you didn't even know took place. You see, people want to think that they have to see it, but you don't see it. You don't see salvation. It's a, it's a heart thing. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. You, you believe on him in your heart. You didn't see it, but it happened. The church... The next thing is, the last thing I want to tell you about, the church is likened to a bride. Romans 7, verse 1. It says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So if you're married, then you're bound to the spouse. You can't just leave them because you don't like them. It says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband, as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So she's there's a woman that's got this husband. She's bound to her husband until he dies, or unless he does something else happen that gave her grounds for divorce, but she's bound to him until he dies. And if the person dies, if your spouse dies, then you're loose from them, and you're free to remarry. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So this lady that's got this husband, if he's still alive, they're still together, and she goes out and joins flesh with this other man, she's an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So if her husband dies, she's free to go find somebody else and marry that person and be no adulteress. It says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also... Now, here's the illustration. Verse 4, Romans 7, 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You see, when you got saved, your flesh died with the Lord Jesus, it was buried, and your soul was resurrected. And... It says he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you got saved, God counted your flesh as dead. He considered it crucified on the cross, buried in the tomb, and he raised you up to sit in heavenly places in Christ. In Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, it says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You can't lose your salvation. You're already as good as in heaven, spiritually speaking. You just got the body down here, and you're just, all you're waiting on, you got everything 
at salvation, you got everything that, that salvation is going to give you is set for your new body. And that's all you're waiting for. Romans 8, 23. Waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. That's all we're waiting on. I'm already there in Jesus. I'm just waiting on my body to be there in heaven with the Lord. So you see the illustration, the husband and wife. She's bound to her husband as long as he's alive, but as, when he's dead, she's free to marry somebody else. Just like when you when you got saved. When you got saved, God cut your soul loose from your flesh. A separation took place. A divorce took place. Your flesh was no longer stuck to your body. The flesh died. And God took that sharp two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, he took that sharp two-edged sword, performed an operation on you, cut your soul loose from your flesh, a divorce took place, your flesh is dead, now your soul is free to marry who it wants. And it's marrying the Lord Jesus Christ, him that was raised from the dead. Look at that again. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. When you got baptized into the body of Christ, you be, your flesh is dead. That you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, the Lord Jesus, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3. Look at what it says. Paul said, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So we are in, in, uh, espoused, engaged to Jesus Christ, and we are one chaste virgin. You're one chaste virgin in Christ. If Kim Kardashian or the biggest hoe out there that you know got saved today, she would be a part of one chaste virgin, spiritually speaking. Because when God looks at the bride, he sees spotless, sinless, spiritually speaking. And the biggest hoe out there that gets saved, she becomes a part of one chaste virgin. It says in Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, wives, now we're going to get into the back into the chapter that showed us the great mystery where he speaks of Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 22, once again, comparing the husband and wife relationship to Christ and the church, which is the bride, the body and the church and the bride is all born again believers. Ephesians 5, 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Jesus Christ is the head. And when the woman runs things, it ruins the picture. That's like the bride being the head over Jesus Christ. That wouldn't make sense. If the woman's running things, that's like the, the bride running Jesus Christ. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything, just like you are to let the let the husbands or let the let Christ be ahead of everything. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So not only does the wife ruin the picture when she won't submit to the husband, but the husband ruins the picture when the husband doesn't love the wife like he's supposed to. That is, like Jesus Christ putting giving his life for the for the bride. You see? You should love your wife enough to die for. You see, Jesus Christ doesn't put himself before me and you. He puts you first. Jesus Christ isn't selfish like the average husband is. He doesn't put his own needs before yours. When you call on him, he doesn't tell you to come back later. It says in Ephesians 5, 26 through 28, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The Savior is what makes us holy and without blemish. He's the bridegroom. We are the bride. If, if you want your wife to start acting more holy, maybe you should 
get the word to her. Sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So it says in Ephesians 5, 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. The best way to know how to be a good husband is to look at how Jesus Christ treats his bride. Jesus Christ pleased not himself. As Paul talks about, he gave himself a ransom for all. He made himself of no reputation. You want to know how to treat your wife? You put your wife first. After God, of course. But you put her before yourself. It says in Ephesians 5.29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. When a man and woman are married, that means they are one flesh. And no man with any sense is going to hurt his own flesh, so he shouldn't hurt his wife. The Lord, the Lord never puts the bride down. The Lord never makes fun of the bride. He never forgets his bride. And you can count on him that he's going to show up, that he's going to be there. He doesn't neglect his bride. He goes where she goes. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you follow that, then you can know how to treat your wife. It says in Ephesians 5, 30 through 33, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. See, when you got saved, or, and, or when you got married, you became one flesh with your wife. When you got saved, you became one with the Lord Jesus Christ. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. How does two people become one flesh? It's a mystery. How does all these people getting saved become one in the body, one with Christ? This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. So you see that? The husband and wife relationship compared to Christ and the church, which is the bride. It says in Genesis 2, 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So that's Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are, pit, are the picture. Adam pictures Jesus Christ. Eve pictures the bride. You see, Adam got his bride from his body. Remember? His rib. Jesus Christ got his bride from his body. You see the picture? Adam was pierced in his side to get his bride. Laid down. God put, performed an operation on him. Took his rib. Formed Eve out of that. And when Jesus Christ was making the way for his bride to be, the soldier pierced Jesus Christ in his side. So they were both pierced in their side to get a bride. And then what happened? When they got the bride, the serpent came and tempted Eve when Adam wasn't present, right? Just like the serpent is coming and trying to beguile you every day before the Lord comes back to get you. So you see the picture. Just like Paul says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. So you see, you, after you got saved, when the moment you got saved, you were baptized into the body of Christ. So you are a member of the church. Even if you've never actually joined a local church, you're a member of the church. The church is the body of Christ. We're all members, all saved people are members of that one body. Even if you don't feel like you're important, you are. The body can't do it without you. And we're, we make up the bride. Christ and the church is compared to the husband and wife relationship. We make up the bride of Christ. We're espoused to him. We're waiting on the uh, re uh, rapture where we're going to get a new body. And then we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ and then marriage. We're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's where we're going to be married to the Lord. So this is a great mystery. Christ and the church.